Thank you very much, uh, Greg, for the kind introduction. Yeah, so the question we want to ask today is whether it's time to take the Big Bang out of the Big Bang Theory. That might seem like a radical idea at first, but it's not as radical as it seems. It's true that there's an abundant amount of empirical evidence in, uh, for the Big Bang Theory. Any cosmologist would tell you that. At the same time, there's not a shred of empirical evidence for the Big Bang. Why is that possible? Well, it's because the Big Bang theory is really a merging of two very different ideas, ideas that are on very different scientific footing. Idea one is that the observable universe was once smaller, hotter, denser, and has been expanding and cooling for the last 13.8 billion years. We have a lot of evidence for that, beginning with uh, Edwin Hubble's uh, observations from the 1920s, all the way up to the most recent uh, observations from the most sophisticated telescopes and detectors uh, on the ground, in space, and balloons. And with that evidence, we can trace the evolution of the universe from the present, going back in time to when the first atoms formed, around 400,000 years after the beginning of expansion, and even further back to when uh, the universe had a temperature that was at nuclear fusion temperatures and protons and neutrons could be fused together to form the first uh, heavy nuclei in the history of the universe. We can go beyond that using experiments in the laboratory from particle physics, particle physicists, uh, which take us a few orders of magnitude earlier in time, indirectly. But ID two is the idea two is the idea that the universe began in the Big Bang. And to get to the Big Bang, we have to extrapolate 15 orders of magnitude higher in temperature than anything we've observed in a laboratory, or 60 uh, orders of magnitude higher in density. And that's why we have no evidence for the Big Bang itself. This dichotomy this idea, this notion that there are these two ideas that make up the theory is something that cosmologists are well aware of. And I can do nothing better than to quote my colleague, Jim Peebles, who in 2019 won the Nobel Prize for his contributions to the Big Bang Theory, but was quick to explain in an interview afterwards that, quote, the first thing to understand about my field is that its name, Big Bang Theory, is inappropriate. It's very unfortunate that one thinks of beginning, of, a, of the beginning, whereas in fact, we have no uh, theory of such a thing as the beginning. So he shares the same concern. In fact, the Big Bang has always been a sketchy idea. Probably most of you, when you first heard the idea, thought it was rather strange. Mathematically, it's a singularity. That means it's a mistake or a problem when we solve the equations going backwards in time that we reach a point where temperatures and densities become infinite. Normally, when we encounter a singularity and solving equations, we know there's something wrong with the theory that we're extrapolating. And that's true here. Most of us believe that before we get to that singularity, an instant before we get to that singularity, we have to take account of wild quantum gravity effects, which produce wild undulations in space-time, as this picture is meant to figuratively represent, and, um, and which excite all kinds of degrees of freedom. Exactly what this quantum gravity phase is and how it connects to the rest of the story isn't clear, but there are various terms or euphemisms that fellow scientists use to describe it. Some describe it as a phase of quantum foam, some as emergent space-time, some as tunneling from nothing. And we can go all the way back to Georges Lemaitre, who in the 1920s talked about a primeval atom. But I'm not here today to try to explain to you what the Big Bang is or is not. Instead, the bottom line of today's talk is going to be that the Big Bang has got to go altogether. And the reason isn't philosophical and isn't aesthetic, uh, 
It's actually purely practical, pragmatic, basic science. The problem is that if we have a big bang and we follow it by expansion only, then we can't explain the most apparent salient features of our universe. And that's why the Big Bang has got to go and be replaced with something else. Now, when I say the apparent salient features of the universe, I can point to all the data that we've collected over the last century, which supports this idea one that we talked about a few slides ago. But a lot of this gets summarized in an image that we can uh, create by collecting together the cosmic microwave background radiation that first began to stream through the universe when the first atoms formed, and that we can use to provide a snapshot of what the universe looked like at that time, before there were galaxies and stars, when the first atoms were forming. The iconic image has been, um, is the one that's shown here. It, what it's supposed to represent is a surface around us at great distances, far beyond the stars and galaxies. So imagine that spherical surface, and we're, uh, that's the image that we're, uh, that's what we're making an image of. And then we're projecting it on an oval, much like we do when we're projecting the surface of the earth on an oval in order to present it in a flat two-dimensional map. So this represents the entire sky projected into this oval. Imagine us sitting in the middle. The red and blue um, colorations in the map are false color uh, added to the map to represent the variations in temperature and density at this very early stage, this uh, infant, infant stage of the universe. They represent variations in temperature of less than 0.01%, very tiny variations. For the purpose, they're, they're fascinating to, uh, to study and to study the implications of. But for what we're, going to, what we're going to talk about today, what we really want to do is focus uh, on the same picture, but with slightly lower resolution. And the striking thing that one gets if one reduces the resolution by just a little bit is to first approximation, the universe is remarkably homogeneous, remarkably, universe, remarkably uniform in any direction we look and wherever we look. Furthermore, we can use the data from this image to infer what is the geometry of space. In principle, in general relativity, that geometry could be curved or warped. But in fact, what we discover is that that geometry is flat, Euclidean. The laws of Euclidean geometry hold beautifully in this universe. The sums of angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Another interesting feature of this image is that it shows us that the matter and radiation were in thermal equilibrium, uh, which means that they were at maximal entropy. But if you think about the total entropy in the universe at that time, it's actually much smaller than it could be by many tens of orders of magnitude. If you were to take the same matter and compress it into a black hole, for example, it would increase in entry, entropy by 30 orders of magnitude. So there's something peculiar about this low entropy as well. In fact, it's partitioned in a strange way because the matter and radiation are in thermal equilibrium, which means they're in, at maximal entropy. Whereas the geometry, the space-time, the gravity is nearly perfectly uniform, so almost no entropy. So how is it that we have a lot of entropy in matter radiation, but almost no entropy in the gravitational degrees of freedom? And then finally, this uh, phase is well described by classical physics. That's not to say that we can ignore quantum physics, but they make small, quantum physics makes small corrections to this picture. It can be understood from a classical point of view. Now, if you think about these five properties and you think about the Big Bang, then you realize the Big Bang is about as far away from these conditions as you can imagine. It's very much a quantum state phase of the universe, where quantum physics reigns over the classical. As you can see from the drawing, it's anything from homogeneous. It's certainly not flat. In fact, you can't even define the geometry of it in any sensible way. 
In the quantum gravity phase, gravity is acting very strongly on all degrees of freedom. All degrees of freedom get excited, gravitational and matter and radiation. So you would expect coming out of this phase, the entropy to be very high. And there'd be no particular reason why it'd be partitioned in the peculiar way we observe, observe in the cosmic microwave background map. Realizing this, cosmologists have recognized, realizing this problem, uh, cosmologists have uh, thought hard about how we can connect the Big Bang uh, to the, what we see in the cosmic microwave background at later stages in the universe. And what this has led to for the last few decades is adding a band-aid to the story, a kind of patch to the story that we call inflation. Now, the question we wanna to ask today is, is this Band-Aid actually working? Is there an alternative? And if so, what is it? But in order to address those questions, I wanna go back and say something more about how this inflation is supposed to do its work. Now, I'm imagining that many of you have read or heard about inflation before. And if I were to ask you, or if I were to ask a typical cosmologist in, in, in my field, how is it that inflation works? Most of them would describe it in a few words using what I would call a classical physics view. So how do we smooth the universe? Well, if we imagine space-time being analogous to a wrinkly rubber sheet, and we imagine inflation, which is a period of stretching very, very fast, we might think as we stretch it, it's gonna appear smoother and smoother. Or if I asked you how we flatten the universe with inflation, I think most of you who have heard of inflation and most cosmologists would drum up pictures like this, which actually comes from a text in which you imagine uh, space-time being analogous to uh, an inflating sphere. And as you inflate the sphere, in fact, the word inflation comes from that notion, as you inflate the sphere, the surface becomes flatter and flatter and flatter. And it's the fact that people walk around with this very simple idea of how you smooth and flatten the universe that makes the idea of inflation so compelling to people. It seems so simple. It seems so obvious. What could be simpler? Well, the problems with the explanations that I just gave you is that they're wrong. They're not just wrong, but they're misleading. They mislead you into believing that expansion is the essential element to smoothing and flattening the universe. And that is not true. The truth is just the opposite. As I'll try to convince you today, the best hope we have, the best idea we have for explaining the smoothness and flatness of the universe is not any kind of expansion, but rather a kind of contraction, a kind of slow contraction. But to explain that, I have to give you a little bit more background on what the correct explanation is as to how inflation works. And to do that, I have to introduce some basic concepts. So I've tried to redu reduce the number of concepts to as few as I can. I'm gonna be talking about three quantities during, uh, uh, during the course of this talk. The first is called the scale factor. The scale factor is a dimensionless conformal factor, which simply describes by what factor the universe has expanded or contracted compared to some initial time. You get to choose the initial time. Let's say we use today. The scale factor we could choose to be one today, and then we could describe what, how much it expanded or contracted going forward or backward in time. It's not something we can observe. It's just a factor of increase. We can't observe its absolute value. The second quantity is called the Hubble parameter. The Hubble parameter is the logarithmic derivative of the scale factor, or a dot over a, the time, where a dot is the time derivative. It measures the rate of expansion, and it's something we do measure, we can measure. In fact, Hubble measured it for the first time back in the 1920s by observing the rates at which uh, gal distant galaxies were expanding away from us uh, uh, compared to their velocity and distance from us. So that's a measurable quantity. 
The third quantity is called the equation of state. It's the one that will probably be least familiar to most of you. It's saying something about the form of energy that occupies the universe at any given time, the dominant form of energy, the one that's determining the rate of expansion or contraction. It's a measure of the ratio of the pressure to the energy density. So more precisely, it's three halves times the quantity one plus pressure over energy density. Um, in the universe, which is dominated by radiation, epsilon happens to be equal to two. Radiation is high pressure. In a universe dominated by matter, epsilon is equal to three halves. In a universe that's dominated by dark energy, epsilon approaches zero, can be, uh, be much less than one. And in thinking about our cosmological models, how we're going to explain uh, how we go from Big Bang to the microwave background, or what we might use to replace the Big Bang, we can imagine other forms of energy that come to dominate the universe. These are often described in terms of scalar fields, fields like the Higgs field, which have value everywhere in space and time, and which evolve according to uh, some potential, some rules with time to produce different equations of state. With such a scalar field, one can imagine possibilities of having an equation of state epsilon that could be as small as zero or could be arbitrarily big. And we'll be thinking about that entire range during the rest of this talk. Now, there are two, two important things to keep in mind. Only two equation-like equations that we need to think about or proportionalities we need to think about. Um, the first is, uh, has to do with the energy density. The energy density for any given type of energy depends on its equation of state, and it's proportional to one upon A to the power two epsilon. So if we have a universe which is expanding and a is uh, growing, therefore, then the energy density is decreasing. But note that in general, it doesn't decrease as A cubed. It doesn't decrease as the volume. That would only be true if epsilon is equal to three halves, only for the case of pressureless matter. If the universe has high pressure, epsilon greater than three halves, then the energy density falls off faster. And that's because energy is drawn from, uh, uh, from, uh, from the energy sources, whatever that energy is, into gravity. Conversely, if the universe is, is contracting, now A is shrinking. Now, when epsilon is large, now the energy density is growing and it's growing faster and faster, the bigger epsilon is. The second important fact is what, is what we can derive from Einstein's theory of general relativity. If we assume a universe which is uh, uniform for the moment, then Einstein's uh, equations of general relativity relate those three quantities we had on the previous slide. Here on the right is the scale factor, which is telling us something about geometry. Given a patch of space, it's telling us the factor by which it grows or shrinks. In the exponent is sitting epsilon, a quantity which tells us the pressure to energy density ratio of whatever form of energy is dominating the universe at that time. The quantity H inverse or one over H is a measure of what we call the Hubble time. It's roughly the A, if we were talking about today's Hubble parameter, it's roughly the age or time since the universe began expanding. And if we multiply it by C, the speed of light, it's roughly the distance that light can travel over that time. In other words, it's roughly speaking how far you can see. For the purposes of this lecture, I'll just use that phrase, how far you can see, or Hubble radius to represent the same thing. Now let's return to this issue of how we flatten the universe, for example. So, we go back to this picture that we see in many books and texts, and we notice there's something wrong with this pic set of pictures. It's showing us the expansion. It's telling us something about the scale factor, but where's the epsilon? Where's the H inverse in this story? All of them should be involved to really explain the smoothing or flattening of the universe. So we need to 
take a more close look, closer look at what's going on. So the first thing to realize is that when we talk about whether the universe is smooth or flat, cosmolo cosmologically smooth or flat, we're not asking if it's actually smooth or flat. We're asking about its apparent smoothness or apparent flatness. By apparent, I mean, given how much of the universe we can see, does it appear to be flat? Not whether it's actually flat. And you'll see that's an important difference. For example, consider an expanding universe, just like we did on the previous slide. And a, a universe I'll represent here as a sphere. And it's growing by a factor of two in radius as I go from the left to the right each, at each step. I'm thinking about the case where the pressure of the, energy, of the energy that occupies the universe is greater than zero, where epsilon is greater than one, like we have in a matter or radiation dominated universe. Now we have to think about this relation we, we show between the Hubble radius and the scale factor. If the universe is growing, if A is increasing, and if epsilon is greater than one, then we see that the Hubble radius is growing faster than A. That means in terms of our spheres, although the spheres are growing, the Hubble radius is growing faster. So if you think of the Hubble radius as how far you can see, and you imagine you're standing at the North Pole, how far you could see would be determined by the Hubble radius, let's say at the beginning, at a given time, and then what's going to happen is as the, as the ball grows in size, as A increases, the Hubble radius is also going to grow, but it grows faster because epsilon is bigger than one. So that takes us now to a spherical cap, which is bigger and bigger still. The figure of merit of whether or not the universe is flattening or not flattening is a comparison of how much of it we can see or the radius of the spherical cap compared to the radius of the sphere. So in this case, we see that as we go from left to right, the spherical cap is growing faster in radius than the radius of the sphere itself. The curvature that you would observe, if you could observe everything in that spherical cap on the right is becoming more and more apparent. Triangles are looking to have angles which are you know, different than 180 degrees. It's, it becomes easier and easier, easier to find such triangles. The universe is not flattening. The universe is unflattening. The universe is becoming apparently curved. So this is the problem with the universe that goes from a big bang straight to radiation and then matter domination. The apparent flatness is, uh, uh, apparent flatness is not happening. Rather, the universe is becoming apparently more and more curved. As, we, as the universe expands. And it's been expanding for a long time. So doubling many, many times, more than 60 times. So by now you'd expect the universe to be apparently highly curved. That's not what we observe in the microwave background. We observe the opposite, it's flat. And that was one of the reasons for introducing inflation. How does inflation change the story? Well, the crucial thing about inflation is that it's a state in which the dominant form of energy density has negative pressure, where epsilon is much less than one. And if epsilon is much less than one, now the situation reverses itself. The Hubble radius is growing much slower than A. Although the universe is still growing in size A, the Hubble radius, if epsilon is, let's say, close to zero, is hardly changing at all. So as the sphere grows, if we're limited to only seeing what's within our Hubble radius, the apparent flattening of the universe is occurring. That is to say, the ratio of the Hubble, ra the Hubble radius, the ratio of the circles, or the ratio of the spherical cap is becoming smaller and smaller compared to the radius of the space-time itself. And that's how inflation is supposed to work. But once you realize that, you realize that there's a third possibility that we haven't mentioned yet. And that's the idea of a contracting universe. So at first you'd look at the contracting universe and you'd say it's hopeless because as my sphere contracts, it's becoming more and more curved. But we need to consider the Hubble radius. What's happening to that compared to the size of the sphere? Now the scale factor is decreasing because the universe is contracting. 
In a slowly contracting universe, we can have epsilon much greater than one. It can be 10, it could be 50, it could be 100. And so that means that the Hubble radius, every time A increase, uh, decreases by a factor of two, the Hubble radius decreases by an enormous factor, an exponentially large factor. So even if the universe were apparently curved to begin with, if the universe just contracts a little bit, if A just contracts a little bit, the Hubble radius contracts a lot. And within that Hubble radius, the universe appears to be flat. So this is an, this is an equally good way of flattening the universe. In fact, I'm being unfair. It's actually a better way of contracting the universe because slow contraction is in a, in a sense much faster than inflation. Consider the inflationary case. Let's imagine in going from the small sphere to the large sphere, the radius of the sphere has increased by a factor of two. During inflation, the Hubble radius is nearly constant. So the ratio of the, ratio of the circle, ra radius of the circle to the radius of the sphere has decreased by a factor of two. We flatten the universe, but by only a factor of two. Now let's imagine slow contraction with epsilon, say, of 100. During this same period, during a period in which the uh, space contracts by a factor of two, the Hubble radius contracts by a factor of two to the 100th power. So although the radius of the sphere has shrunk, the radius of the circle has shrunk by an exponentially large, larger power. So that means the degree of flattening has, is much greater. So slow contraction is an incredibly powerful flattener of, the flattener of the universe. And we could apply the same thing to our wrinkled sheet and conclude that it's an extremely powerful smoother of the universe. But there's another difference between inflation and slow contraction. Inflation begins after a violent Big Bang. And we have described the conditions of that Big Bang. It's inhomogeneous, space is curved and warped, it has very high entropy, it has uh, an entropy which is not partitioned at all, equal in gravity, gravitational degrees of freedom and matter degrees of freedom, and it's a quantum phase. And we said we have a problem linking up that condition to what we observe in the microwave background. But we have exactly the same problem in linking it to the beginning of inflation, because inflation also assumes that the universe at that time at the beginning of inflation can be described classically. It also puts stringent requirements on the entropy of the universe. The entropy of the universe must be incredibly low, much lower than we needed to for the cosmic microwave background by you know, nearly hundred orders of magnitude. And if we don't come out of uh, the Big Bang uh, very uniform or very uh, smooth, if we have significant inhomogeneities curves and warps, then it will be hard to get inflation started, or even if we get it started, it may tend to end too soon. And since it's more likely to have begun that way, it's more likely that inflation will end up either not starting or starting, but not smoothing enough to produce the kind of universe we observe. But the way I like to summarize the story is, um, it's hard to go from the Big Bang to inflation, but if you tr do try to go, no inflation is probably more likely than inflation and bad inflation, producing infl some inflation, but not enough to explain what we observe is more likely than good inflation. This is called the initial conditions problem of inflation. How do we manage to get it started? Now, by contrast, slow contraction begins under far gentler conditions. We do the same thing as we did for uh, inflation. We extrapolate back in time, but be if, because the universe is contracting going forward in time, going backwards in time, it's opening up. It's becoming, well, less and less dense. It's approaching Minkowski space. It's well-defined classically. It's nearly an empty Minkowski space. It has low energy density. It has low en entropy density. We can track such a universe in going from this initial state to slow contraction using ordinary classical equations of motion. 
Now that doesn't mean, uh, and, and we can also use the fact that um, uh, slow contraction is fast. Why is that important? Well, because even though we have these gentler conditions, they can in some sense still be wild. It could be that the energy density or shear in the universe or curvature of the universe is still wildly varying over space. We still have to take care of that through the slow contraction. So it's important that when we finally get to the slow contraction phase that the slow contraction is very fast. To analyze what happens when we go from some wild initial state and go approach a period of slow contraction, we can't use usual analytic paper and pencil tools that cosmologists use. We need something more powerful. We need to solve the full Einstein equations in their full glory using the tools of numerical relativity. The same tools that were developed for describing two black holes merging and coalescing can, with some considerable mathematical and theoretical effort also be applied to describe the universe, beginning from some wild initial state to approaching a phase of slow contraction. And I'm gonna show you quickly some simulations from this kind of work. The simulations are going to um, uh, picture different uh, contributions to the Einstein equations. Uh, um, what I called omega matter, that's going to measure the energy density which is driving the slow contraction, some scalar field which would be driving the slow contraction. Omega k, the curvature of the universe, the thing we're trying to get rid of. And omega s, the shear of the universe, distortions, shear distortions, which we also need to get rid of. For simplicity, we're, although we're solving the full three plus one Einstein equations, we're only gonna imagine that we had spatial variations along two directions. So I can represent that as a sheet. So for example, the green sheet represents the variations in the shear uh, across the space. And the fact that it's so high on this image means that the universe is completely dominated by this shear contribution, very far from the smooth universe that we need to get to explain the microwave background. The curvature, the red sheet, similarly wildly distorted, is going to be, is, is also distorted, and that's there. And then the matter is sort of in third place, uh, almost covered up entirely by these other contributions. Now, using the tools of numerical relativity, the combination of mathematics, general relativity, and numerical simulation, I'm going to show you what happens as we go forward in time. I should warn you that you should not blink because it's going to, what's going to happen is going to happen very fast. So ready, set, there it is. The rest of the movie is very boring because nothing happens. All the action happened at the beginning. All the smoothing of the universe happened at the beginning and you could hardly notice it, but let's go back and take a look at it. So I'll show the movie, uh, sorry. I'll show the uh, movie again. But this time I'll stop the clock and bring time backwards. And notice that even though we started in some very wild state, it only took a few clicks of the clock for the universe to become smooth, after which that was the end of the story. And by smooth, we got just the smooth flat universe that we need to explain the cosmic microwave background, the, 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 uh, its average uniformity, homo homogeneity and uniformity. This is uh, an indication of just how powerful and fast this slow contraction is. I should mention that the time there is in units where it takes 10 clicks, or actually a dozen clicks of the clock, a dozen a change of 12 in order for the universe to contract by just a one e-fold. So this entire smoothing process, which in this clock, uh, which on this clock, took only about, what, 
We'll, see, we'll call it when it's smooth. It's smooth around this time. It's about 10 clicks of the clock. That means the universe is hardly contracted at all. And already it's in the smooth state that you'd like it to be in. And this isn't just one simulation. This is one of a set of hundreds of simulations we've done, changing conditions in all kinds of ways. Here's another example. Sorry. Here's another example. We begin with even wilder conditions, and we'll see how much time it takes this time. See if you can follow it. Well, almost the same amount of time. It's very insensitive. That's how fast and powerful this, uh, this kind of slow contraction is. We can't do such a thing for inflation at the present time. In fact, it probably can't be done. And that's the story about inflation versus slow contraction when we simply view things from a classical physics point of view. Slow contraction is a powerful, powerful, smoother classically. But we turned off quantum physics. Let's turn back on quantum physics and ask what that, change, what that does to change the story. Well, you think very little. If you're thinking about inflation, which is supposed to be smoothing the universe, classically through stretching, we would think quantum fluctuations would have rather small effects. So if we began with, let's say, a patch of space, which was smooth and flat to begin with, then we would expect that while it's inflating, if it's smooth and flat to begin with, we'll start, we'll give, give inflation a break, we're going to start smooth and flat to begin with, we'd expect that the Hubble parameter would be, have the same value everywhere on that sheet. And that's what I'm plotting along the sheet. It represents a patch of space. I'm, I'm using a two-dimensional sheet rather than three space dimensions, but just so we can visualize. But think of the two-dimensional sheet as representing a patch of space, which is everywhere at high Hubble parameter, uh, high value of the Hubble parameter. If inflation is really invulnerable to quantum fluctuations, if it's truly a smoothing kind of operation, then it ought to be that even when we add the quantum effects, we ought to see that all that happens to this sheet is number one, it stretches a lot. Well, I'm not gonna show you the stretching because then it would be out of our field of view. So we're gonna divide out the stretching of it, just to keep that in mind, we're dividing out the stretching. But the other thing we should see is as inflation comes to, end, comes to an end, the value of the Hubble parameter should everywhere be drifting downwards like this and like this. And that would be our litmus test, that inflation is invulnerable to quantum fluctuations. But here's the reality. Here's what happens when you actually perform the test. Instead of remaining smooth and flat, something very wild is happening. It's becoming weirder and weirder. Stalactites are going everywhere universe is any, anything but smooth. And now we're gonna loop it through several times. You can watch it again and again while I speak. What's going on? What's going on is that in order for, to infl for inflation to end, it doesn't end purely through classical physics. It's affected by quantum physics. Quantum physics can change when one region of the uh, space ends inflation compared to another. One, one region of space dips down to small h compared to another. There can be rare fluctuations which actually keep patches of the universe in the inflating phase long after you would have expected it to have remained there. The fluctuations keep, keep kicking the universe back into inflating more and more. Because that's happening all along, you can see that most of the manifold here is remaining high at large values of H. That means it's still inflating. Inflation, in fact, continues forever. It's eternal. And what about those stalactites that are happening there? Those are the rare regions of the universe that manage to escape from inflation and get to the bottom and end. But you see, those are, uh, 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 they form a space-time which is highly inhomogeneous and not smooth. This is what inflation does to space if you include quantum effects. It's not a smoother, it's an unsmoother. And to make matters worse, if we were to paint this picture at the end, where we have these stalactites, according to what are the curvatures 
What are the inhomogeneities? What, are, what is the microwave background properties, et cetera? In each of those stalactites, which are the few regions of space, which is the set of measure zero which, uh, space, which is managing to get to the uh, end inflation, you'd find, from, as you can see from the colors, every conceivable possibility. This is what cosmologists call a multiverse, a universe which be, in this case began perfectly smooth and uniform, but ended up anything but a universe with mul a multiplicity, an infinite multiplicity of possible endings where inflation ends. And this is a major fail because our goal was to explain smoothness and flatness. And what's obvious from this picture is that smoothness and fl flatness are not the general outcome of a multiverse. Anything can happen. That's not to say smoothness and flatness can't happen, but it's not the general outcome. It's not what you have any good reason to expect. Now, what about if you play the same game with slow contraction? Well, the slow contraction, we begin at small h. So we try the same litmus test. So we begin at small h. And as the universe um, contracts, well, we should expect to see this sheet rise in some way and end up at large h uh, at the end of slow contraction. And in this case, I have no further movie to show you. This is the proper endpoint for slow contraction. And that's because the reason we got into the multiverse issue, we got into that multiverse picture, was because of the rare fluctuations that were inflating, that was to say, were going to huge volumes compared to other regions which ended inflation. But here there is no inflation, it's just contraction. The smoothing is only in the form of contraction. So there is no such quantum runaway effect. So a major difference, one that we can never forget is that there is no quantum runaway. So when we say that slow contraction smooths and flattens the universe, we've shown you now under general conditions and wild initial conditions, it does so. And it does so in a predictive and definite way. Now, we could also ask about other ways of viewing what's going on in this picture and what they tell us about cosmology. Here we're getting to a more speculative area of physics that we call quantum gravity. We don't have a precise theory of quantum gravity at the present time. There are some leading ideas, sometimes called string theory, which uh, dominate current thinking about what might be a good quantum theory of gravity. But uh, a number of theorists, uh, particularly led by Kumun Vafa at Harvard and um, Hiroshi uh, Agure at Caltech, have been thinking in a general way how quantum gravity might have effects on cosmology. And they've come up with a number of conjectures, arguments, reasoned arguments based on all the examples that they've studied of string theory solutions, for example, or more general arguments based on quantum gravity of any sort to come up with some conjectures that a sensible cosmology must satisfy. And one of those, which I'll, uh, I'll mention here, there are several of them, but I'll only talk about one of them, um, is called the Transplankian Censorship Conjecture, or TCC. And what this conjecture says is that if you have a cosmological scenario that converts subplankian modes to super, Planck, super Hubble radius modes, it is going to be inconsistent with any theory of quantum gravity. So what are, what are they talking about? Well, by subplankian modes, they're talking about modes, we're talking about quantum fluctuations, which are kind of wiggles of fields or wiggles of space time, whose wavelength or typical size is smaller than the Planck length. The Planck length is around 10 to the minus 43 centimeters. It's the scale below which we expect there to be large quantum gravity effects. What they're saying is as long as those fluctuations remain on those small scales, you're fine. But if you imagine a scenario which takes those fluctuations and stretches them, so if their wavelength becomes bigger than the Hubble radius, now you've changed, taken those quantum gra gravity fluctuations and you've drawn them up to scales which are classicalized by being larger than the Hubble radius. And since we don't have control of the quantum theory, we don't know what the effects of those large quantum effects are going to be on those fluctuations, we can't base a cosmological scenario on such a scenario in such a situation. It would be inconsistent, likely inconsistent with whatever 
quantum gravity would dictate. And that's important for our story because this is exactly what happens in inflation. In inflation, we begin, uh, we begin the universe expanding at an accelerating rate, and that is sufficient to take any kind of fluctuation. It will stretch in proportion to the scale factor A. The scale factor grows by a huge exponential amount, and by the end of inflation, those wavelengths would be greater than the Hubble radius. And what they're saying is that would violate the TCC, the Transplankian Censorship Conjecture. You, your theory that you use to describe this would not be consistent with the laws of quantum gravity. Now, to be honest, it's a conjecture based on lots of theoretical evidence, not proven, but we don't know yet of a counterexample either. Finally, let me say a few words about observations because it's also important to think about observations. What observations support the idea of slow contraction? Well, I would point to homogeneity and flatness first. Those are often properties that are credited to inflation or have been credited up to, to inflation in the past. But what we've seen is that we can't say, we can't argue that inflation predicts or produces or explains homogeneity and flatness, since what it actually produces, the one thing it actually produces is a multiverse of out outcomes, most of which are not either homogeneous or flat. The proper way to ascribe homogeneity, the observed homogeneity and flatness we see in the microwave background based on ideas that we know are present, the only one we can ascribe it to, I would say logically is slow contraction. But you may not find that satisfying because you may say, but we already were thinking about homogeneity and flatness. We already knew those properties of the universe. Is there something you can tell us about that we haven't yet measured? And the answer to that is also yes. Another thing that happens while the universe is smoothing, whether it's inflation or, 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 um, or slow contraction, is there will be quantum fluctuations that produce distortions in the dis tiniest distortions in the distribution, some, uh, in some cases, tiny distortions in the distribution of matter or density that will produce fluctuations that are supposed to be the fluctuations we see in the microwave background. They will also produce, in most cases, most ways we imagine producing the fluctuations uh, in density that we see in the microwave background, they will also tend to produce shears, random shears in the universe, what we call tensor modes or gravitational waves in the universe on huge, enormous scales. There's one exception to this, which is the case of slow contraction, which can produce fluctuations in density, but doesn't produce large, uh, detectable levels of these random shears. Now, these random shears produce a, an effect on the polarization pattern of the microwave background, which is called B-mode polarization. And, um, uh, what we what uh, we have found so far, uh, and it attempts to look for this B-mode polarization, is no such effect consistent with what you'd expect for uh, slow contraction. What I'm showing you here is a picture from the Atacama Desert, showing the site of the forthcoming Simons Observatory, which shows which is where they plan to build a detector that will greatly improve our limits or detection of this B-mode polarization effect. And if they observe it. That would be a big problem for what I've described for you today in terms of slow contraction. Of course, if they don't, it would be perfectly consistent with what we expect to observe. So let me just briefly sum. I've tried, I've discussed uh, the fact that we need to explain these salient features of the observable universe. And I've discussed a number of properties we need to do that. We need gentle starting conditions. We need a rapid smoother and flattener. We need highly robust smoother. We need to make sure we have no quantum runaway, no multiverse. If we believe the quantum gravity conjectures, we better not have a long period of accelerated expansion so that it's TCC satisfying. And we ought to have a theory that explains in a natural way why we're not seeing the B, B modes, at least not so far. And a big bang followed by expansion, inflation or otherwise, doesn't satisfy all these conditions. In fact, a Big Bang followed by inflation does not satisfy any of these conditions. And that's the reason why, that so far as we currently know, a Big Bang followed by expansion cannot explain the salient features of the universe. 
That's why we need to get rid of the Big Bang. And on the other hand, we've also recently learned, most of the results I've been showing you, in fact, have been just obtained in the last uh, five years, um, that slow contraction satisfies all these conditions. And so that's a real game changer. That's a sign that maybe we have to rethink our overall picture of the evolution of the universe so we can incorporate slow contraction in, into the story. Now, obviously, one thing you need is a way to connect the slow contraction to what we called idea one, the evolution of the universe from the one second on point onwards. And we don't want it to be something that messes up the smoothness and flatness and uniformity we produce during slow contraction. We need a kind of bridge, a bridge that will take us from contraction and smoothly to expansion. We need to replace the Big Bang with something gentle, a gentle bounce. Now, as it turns out, this is not impossible. In fact, again, in just the last five years, the first examples of a gentle bounce that seem to be stable and smooth that can connect a contracting universe to an expanding universe have been discovered theoretically. And so that means, at least theoretically, we have all the elements we now need to put together a complete cosmology, beginning from the far past, where you might have some wild beginning, through a phase of slow contraction, which smooths out that wild beginning, through a gentle bounce to the contraction, and to the microwave background and beyond what we see. And if you can do all that through equations which are deterministic and predictable in this way, you've really accomplished an amazing feat. It's really a kind of for forcing a kind of paradigm shift in the way we view the history of the universe. And once you do that, you can also imagine there are many other interesting implications from this kind of idea. But that would be the subject of another talk. Before I stop, I want to say just a few quick words about some people who have played an important role in what I've discussed here. I have not given references and papers it would have just been too numerous to mention and cluttered the figures if I had done it. But I have to mention three people whose ideas are very much represented in what a talk I gave. I learned a lot of these ideas from them or through work with them. Uh, one of them is Anna Aegis, Anna Iosh, properly pronounced, who um, uh, is the first, who was the person who five years ago tried to convince me that a gentle bounce is possible, even though I was very skeptical. And she proved her point a few months later by producing an actual working example. She's also the person who's leading our current efforts of using the tools of numerical relativity to, uh, uh, to describe what happens uh, uh, in the universe as we go from beginning to slow contraction and eventually through a bounce into the present. So Roger Penrose, of course, is a giant in the field of general relativity and cosmology and has influenced us in many ways and was the recent winner of the Nobel Prize. But what's most relevant to the discussion I gave today is he has been a fierce critic of inflation, probably the first really fierce critic of inflation dating back to the 1980s. And some of the criticisms I discussed today date back to his, uh, his ideas. And then when it came to quantum gravity, I benefited from discussion from a number of people, uh, most recently, and in terms of what I was talking about today from Kumrum Vafa at Harvard and his student, Alec Bajoya, who introduced this idea of the Transplantian uh, censorship conjecture. And we've benefited from the generous support of the Simons Foundation, which has enabled us to build a group of students, postdocs, um, um, graduate students and others who are joining in this effort to, to explore all the possibilities that emerge from this idea. Because what we're talking about here is really the tip of a very large iceberg. If you want to learn more about what we're talking about, what we've been working on, I point you to our website, which is very easy to remember. It's called bouncingcosmology.com. And with that, I turn it over to Greg.